Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international bestseller called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. I know it's been a while since our last episode, and I apologize. It's been my busy season with the catering business that I share with my mom. We work with race car teams, but I'm home now, and I want to thank you for your patience. And I do have some news for you before we start the show. We are doing our very first We Don't Die live theater event in Fort Lauderdale, along with workshops, December 2nd through 5th. And even if you can't join us live, you can join us from the comfort of your own living room, because we'll be doing the theater event live stream and you'll get the video replay. So myself, along with the fantastic mediums, Philip Dykes, Carrie McLeod, and Scott Milligan, will all be there giving you the latest information about the evidence of the afterlife, along with some very fine mediumship demonstrations. So I ask, even if you can't join us live in Florida, but give yourself the gift of hearing from loved ones this holiday season. It can be a very, very tough time of year. And to witness something like this, even live stream on your computer uh, or live in Fort Lauderdale will be very comforting and healing and inspirational. So you can visit we don't die Fort Lauderdale.com. Let me say it again. We don't die Fort Lauderdale.com or we don't die radio.com, which is our home base to find out more. Now on to the show, a lovely woman that I believe will have as a friend for life. Today, we're going to be talking to an afterlife expert who's also an animal communicator and coach. Her name is Karen Anderson, and she is a leader in her field of animal communication, voted as number one award-winning afterlife expert with over 22 years of experience. Karen is widely known for delivering some of the most detailed and accurate messages. She's also an award-winning and number one best-selling author of her books, The Amazing Afterlife of Animals and Hear All Creatures. Karen has earned 17 prestigious national and international book awards. Her books are helping readers navigate through their grief and move forward into healing. Karen is also the founder and CEO of Animal Communication Planet, an exclusive academy offering personalized and private courses for animal communication, book publishing, book marketing, and, and, and entrepreneurs. Karen is fiercely devoted to supporting her coaching clients. She gives each student her personal one-on-one attention, sharing every aspect of her business to ensure their success. She resides in the inland Pacific Northwest of the United States, and she lives on a beautiful 30-acre farm, tending to her gardens and surrounded by the animals she loves. You can visit her website at animalcommunicating.com. Karen Anderson, our new friend, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Hi, Sandra. Thank you so much. I've been so excited to talk to you, and I'm just grateful to be on your show. And thank you, by the way, for hosting such a beautiful show. I think it's so important to share this information and just, I, I love talking about the afterlife. It's my, it's my favorite topic. Yes, it's mine too. And it comes, obviously, I think for both of us through years of getting here. But it's so important and to realize that um, the afterlife is real and our loved ones and our pets we get to see again. And pets are near and dear to me. And so many have even asked me, can we have a little bit more about animals and the afterlife and communication? So... It's perfect that we are talking today. So how does your story begin? I'm sure you didn't wake up at five years old and um, decide you're going to be an animal communication expert. Can you talk a little bit about mm-hmm. Karen and growing up and, yeah. and your road to where you are now? Yes, absolutely. No, I thought I was going to be a veterinarian. And then I discovered that you had to operate on animals. And I thought, oh, I can't do that. No. <laughs> so. I changed course um, as a little kid, but, you know, I've just always loved animals. I always had a ton of them. I was always rescuing little birdies or anything that needed help as a kid, and I could always understand them, uh, what they were feeling, um, what they needed, but it was, you know, it was very much something I thought everyone could do. I didn't know that I was actually communicating with them, and it wasn't until I started sharing little snippets of information to my parents, my family, that a five- or six-year-old child shouldn't know about the family pets um, and their situations. That's when it became very clear to me 
that um, not only it freaked my parents out, they didn't know how I could get that information, but sadly they told me to stop, you know, don't, don't do that. It, it really scared them. They didn't know what to do with, you know, my abilities. So they discouraged me from communicating with animals. So I learned very early to hide it and cover it up and not talk about it. So um, don't do that if you're a parent. <laughs> I can only imagine where I would be right now had my parents encouraged my abilities and uh, taught me about energy and you know connecting with animals and spirits and the afterlife. But um, as it were, that's how my path went. So for a very long time, I kept it to myself and I didn't share it with anyone, but I, I felt a connection to animals that was so strong that it would come back time and time again throughout my life. The theme of animals and how important they are to me just kept resurfacing. And if any of your listeners out there have had a similar experience where they get repetitive um, things happening in their life, you know, we're supposed to pay attention to that. There's, you know, we're getting that information for a reason. Hey, you know, you're supposed to be focusing on this and paying attention to this. So that's what kept happening to me is it just kept popping up on the horizon. So that's where it all started. Hmm. And then growing up and obviously you went to school and everything, what was your career path? Well, it was pretty normal. I grew up in Southern California in a little town called San Dimas, then moved on to Fullerton. And um, it wasn't until many decades later When I was in my law enforcement career, I went from the mortgage industry first, which I don't know what I was doing there. I felt very much like a fish out of water. It was all very (laughs) left-brained, kind of numbers and percentage, uh, interest rates, that sort of thing, and I never liked it. And I went from being a mortgage uh, loan processor, and I became very involved in law enforcement, and I felt this pull It was almost a very strange, almost magnetic kind of attraction to law enforcement, and I caught the bug. I started going on ride-alongs with other deputies in the town that I lived in in Colorado. I'd moved to Colorado, and boy, I just just couldn't uh, get enough of it. And I was a volunteer, a reserve officer for a while, and decided, you know what, I want to do this. So I put myself through the academy. And, you know, the rest, as they say, was history there. But it was during law enforcement, that's where all of my intuitive abilities started to percolate back up again. How'd that happen? So you became a police officer. I did. And I worked in a small town called Bailey, and it's in um, Park County, Colorado, which is about an hour and a half southwest of Denver, Mm -hmm. up in the Rocky Mountains, 8,000 feet elevation, beautiful mountain district, very rural, very remote, a huge area to patrol. The in, um, entire county, north and south Park County, um, are the size approximately of Rhode Island. So you can imagine how big that is. And there were only right. eight of eight of us on the north side. And do you know that show, um, South Park, on Comedy Central yes. with Kenny and Carmen? Okay. South Park. That's just the southern part of my district. I work the northern, North Park. I work northern Park County, and South Park was the southern part of the district. Oh, funny. That's a real place. And (laughs) when (laughs) when I would take people to jail, on the side of the road, there's a little sign. It says, Welcome to South Park. And then there's a picture of Kenny and Cartman and all the little cartoon characters on the side. But anyway, um, it was while I was a deputy that I started to really rely on my senses for my own personal safety. I often worked alone right out of the academy. They put me on a night shift. I worked by myself. There was no backup car. The last backup car was probably someone who went home at 10 p.m., and I was probably out at midnight, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, so there's no backup car. And I had to respond to all the calls myself. So I had to rely on the subtleties, reading energy, reading people, watching body language, paying attention to mannerisms, how people moved, how they held their eyes, how they spoke, how they looked at me, how they didn't look at me. 
And that's when everything started to come back. And I, it was like a, a remembering or an awakening of something that I used to be able to do that I had pushed down for so long. Now I needed this for my own survival. And it came back like full force. No coincidence, isn't it? Interesting I know how the universe works. You may I say know. no, but we're going to say yes and <laughs> keep putting you in these instances. Exactly. Mm. So it was really um, kind of a really exciting time. I was I was kind of blown away by the information I was getting, and very unknowingly, I happened to be at a um, on a call one time where I was. It was a domestic violence call, and the young woman who had been assaulted by her boyfriend was giving me her statement. The um, My fellow officer was on foot looking for the suspect who fled before we arrived on scene, so I was standing in front of her house just taking her statement. When I, her, her little kitty came out, I noticed her little kitty walking out of the house, and being an animal lover, I was like, oh, kitty, <laughs> you know, it's... Like, that's where my attention goes, is right to the kitty. And she said, oh, yeah, that's Smokey, and he's my boy, and I love him. Well, little Smokey, kitty, walked over to this little garden shed, like the kind you'd put a lawnmower in or something like that. And he sat down. It's nighttime. He looked right at me, and I heard the words, inside, look inside. Now, I didn't ask him anything. I wasn't trying to communicate with him. I just heard the words. The cat looked right at me and said, inside, look inside. And I thought for a second, no, that's uh, that's already been searched. That area had already been checked by my partner, so there wouldn't be anybody in there. And then the, the next part of my brain went, what? Did that cat just say what? Right. <laughs> and so I sent the victim aside to safety and I very carefully went around and ordered the suspect to come out of the shed with his hands up and much to my surprise two hands popped out of the garden shed wow Karen so I had that moment where it was like everything stopped I went this can't be happening no way he's really in there how did this happen? How did the cat tell me how, why, 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 how, how, how? I mean, I was just blown away. Mm -hmm. Totally. And that's what started me on the course of, well, if a cat could tell me that, what else could they tell me? So I kind of fell into this checking in with the resident pets on crime scenes to see what information I could obtain. And Sandra the information I got from the animals was often more reliable than what the human eyewitnesses would tell me. Well, can you give See, an example? I know it's yeah, a while back. So, but... Yeah, so animals are not um, biased. They are honest and truthful, and they don't have agendas. They just share facts. They share what they saw, or they share what they're feeling, or I would get flashes and images. So, for instance... Um, on another scene, there was a um, husband and wife, again, domestic violence situation, and the wife had called in saying that the husband was abusing her. When I checked in with the resident pets, there were two dogs there, um, I saw quite the opposite. I saw that the woman had been the aggressor, which is, you know, it happens. People think it sometimes does. it's just the man that's the aggressor, and it's not always the case, so you have to be very careful not to have you know, pass any judgment or go to a scene already thinking that the man is at fault. And the dogs showed me images, real flash, like f fast flashing images of the woman being the aggressor. And what backed it up was uh, a 16 year old son who told me that he heard his mom yelling, screaming, and throwing things at the dad. And the, the dad had red marks and um, you could see where things had hit him, and he had defensive marks on him. So it all lined up, and that's what I look for is the evidence. You look for the evidence that everything points you in the direction that you need to go in. So even though she was the one that called in, she was the one that reported her husband was being violent with her. She was the aggressor, and the dogs backed up the story. Mm. Karen, I have a question. It might be a dumb question, but how do you know it's the animals, not just your intuition telling you this? 
does it happen when animals around, but not when you're, you know, right. Like what made you go like that really was the cat. That really is the dog. (laughs) Right. No, that's a great question. And you know, it's just, again, it's the evidence and it's the information that they share. You know, the information that will come through will be very specific to that pet or very specific to that pet's experience. And it only happens when that pet is around. So it's not like I just have random voices talking to me as I walk down the street. Like, hey, the suspect's over there. You know, it's not like that. Mm. It's very specific and it's very much when um, I'm in that mode of, it's almost like, you know, you get into your work mode, you know, you put your, your work hat on like you, you do catering. You know, when you're in your groove and you put your your work hat on and, and you're doing your job, mm-hmm. you get into a certain mode and it's a rhythm and it's a vibration. When I do that, when I'm in work mode, that's when it all happens. So it's at very specific times and it's only when the animals are there and there's other information that comes through, too. I'm just sharing with you the specifics about each right. case. But it's very specific to that pet and that family. But that is a really great question. This is a great conversation. And I think my <laughs> listeners are on the edge of their seat, too. Like, where is this going to go next? Because this is something I know nothing of, and it's really pretty cool. And I've got a cat floating around this house that doesn't give me the time of day. He loves my aunt. Oh. <laughs> But maybe by the end, there'll be a couple of tips, too. I will. I'll share yeah. all kinds of good stuff with okay. you. Absolutely. Where do you want to go next with your stories? Well, it was uh, truly, um, you know, eye-opening for me. I didn't tell anyone. You know, when I filled out my police reports, I didn't say, oh, you know, the family dog told me the dad did it, you know. Right. I'm not going to say my confidential informants have four legs and a tail. I'm just not going to do that because... <laughs> First and foremost, I was the only female officer on the department, so it was tough enough as it was. I was, you know, surrounded by uh, fellow male officers, and I had to work so much harder and be so much more diligent being the only female um, because truly their lives depended sometimes on me, and they needed to make sure that I was going to be there to cover them in case things went bad. So. You know, I kept everything to myself, but I was completely fascinated by this, so I threw myself into it. I was like, what in the world is going on here? I mean, I was just as shocked as you guys are. It's like, what? So I started really focusing on my abilities and practicing and seeing what information I could obtain. It just snowballed, and that's when I realized you know, wow, this is truly amazing. Animals can tell us all kinds of things. And, you know, I was just scratching the surface. I had animals, um, resident pets, help me find um, a missing boy who went missing in the National Forest. Like, they didn't go sniff him out where he was. They told me which direction he went in. That's incredible. And, And, yes, and this isn't just with domesticated animals. Okay, here's the really crazy wild story that makes me sound like I'm off my rocker, but it really truly happened. And it's all this, all these stories are in my, my books too. Um, I had just gotten out of the Academy. I was brand new rookie. I was literally just off of training out by myself when we got a call for a, 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 a wanted felon who rolled his vehicle at night ditched the car and took off running in the field. Now, remember, we're in a mountain district. There's no street lights. It's pitch black. There's nothing but pine trees. And then I was in a grassy area with tall, tall, dried grass. And the fellow officers that were on scene, um, I was told by my sergeant to stay put in this one area to do, like, this perimeter check to make sure nobody, you know, went through that area. Well, they went in the direction they thought the suspect went, which was to my left. And as I was sitting there in this field by myself listening to my radio, because I had the radio turned up just enough so I could hear it in my ear, I started to have this, what in the heck am I doing here feeling? I'm sitting in this field by myself. There's um, a wanted felon uh, that has been reported to carry weapons and assault police officers loose somewhere in the area and I'm by myself. What am I doing? You know, I had one of those moments like, did I really sign up for this? And 
I started thinking, I started to freak myself out thinking, oh my gosh, what if I really find him? What if he's really here? And as I was having these thoughts, this herd of deer um, came through the field that I was watching. And they knew I was there, and they knew I wasn't a threat, so they were just kind of eating the grass and walking along. And I, as I was having these thoughts, like, where is this guy? Where is he? You know, what am I going to do if I find him? And in that moment, the deer lifted its head, looked at me, and I heard the words, logs, like fallen trees, logs, and I saw a flash and an image of trees stacked on each other. And even though all the police activity was to my left, the deer kept looking to my right, which was in the direction of the logs. So I thought, well, that's weird. Wouldn't you think the deer would be looking to the left where there, you can see mm-hmm. you know, yeah. patrol cars yeah. and sirens and stuff going on? So I thought, well, I'm going to go check this out. So I snuck around in the darkness uh, behind the area where the fallen logs were and in this really powerful, strong voice. I don't know where it came from, but I ordered the suspect to come out with his hands up that he was at gunpoint. And like two little Pop-Tarts popping out of a toaster, these two little hands came up above the tall grass. Wow. So there you have this moment where you're again in total and utter disbelief. I'm still by myself. I'm out there with this felon with a warrant, possibly has a weapon on him. So I'm radioing my fellow officers. I've got him at gunpoint. I've, I have the suspect at gunpoint. So everyone comes, you know, screaming over at top speed. And we get him cuffed. We get him in the patrol car. I'm getting, like, high fives. I'm getting slapped on the back. Hey, way to go, Anderson. How'd you know he was there? How'd you find him? And I'm thinking, <laughs> I am not going to tell these guys that <laughs> you told me, you know. I would be the laughing stock of the department. You know your own skepticism going through this journey. And so you know what what people's minds are like being skeptic. So, yeah, you did the right thing. But now you can tell the story with confidence. I know. Now I can tell it. And now it's, like, really cool for me to tell the story because it's amazing. I'm still amazed by it. I'm still amazed that that happened. But I really think that when you are – following your path, when you're following your passion of what it is that you're supposed to be doing in this lifetime, I really do believe that doors will open, opportunities will present themselves. You know, the universe will manifest for you uh, all of these steps that you need to take to get you down the path that you need to go in, and doors just kept opening for me. It was like they kept lighting up, things kept happening. Once I got out of the mortgage business and started following my true passion, it was like everything shifted and everything changed changed and nothing was like such a struggle anymore and that was a big learning lesson for me because I'd spent like 20 years in the mortgage industry hating my job sure and you know once I said you know what do what's really what am I passionate about what do I really want to do with myself that's when everything changed well thank you for your service not only to make the world a better place and these are communities but now you're in the business of helping heal broken hearts and coaching people and bringing out everybody's best and helping people get the lives of their dreams in so many ways. So oh, I appreciate that so much. So it was an honor to serve. It sure. really was an honor. And I loved it. I, I miss the police work. I do. But this is truly uh, my, my passion of what I do now. This is really what law enforcement geared me up for, believe it or not. Pretty cool. How did you make the leap from law enforcement to animal communicator? Yeah, it sounds kind of crazy. Oh, well, it's great, but it's perfect. And that's what makes you the <laughs> real deal. Because, you know, who does these kind of things? You know, so. Well, you know, I, I, was, um, I was not a spring chicken as a deputy. I was 36 when I graduated from the police academy. And, um, you know, most people coming out of the academy or much younger Mm -hmm. and in law enforcement it's a very physical job you have to be in shape you have to be carrying around 20 pounds of gear and at 8,000 feet that's some pretty high elevation I mean I would get out of breath just taking the laundry up and down the stairs at home you know Mm -hmm. so it was really um, kind of inevitable to me that I was either going to have to move into 
you know, some kind of detective work or desk job or something that being a patrol officer, being out on the streets chasing, you know, criminals, uh, was going to be very physically demanding on me. And I had the realization that that wasn't where I was supposed to go with this. I needed those experiences as a police officer to kickstart my intuitive abilities and get me, you know, of the mindset that this is where I need to go. But I realized that my calling was elsewhere. So I knew I had to leave law enforcement, which was quite heartbreaking for me. Um, but I, And I didn't know what was going to happen, honestly. I just trusted that the universe was going to provide the answers for me and, and light up my path as to where I needed to go. It was kind of a, it was a, a little bit of an unsettling time. You know, as you go forward, you don't know which direction you're going, and it's like, oh, this, this, this doesn't feel very good. But I trusted, and I went with it, and it was bumpy, um, but even more incredible things started to happen again because I was following my passion. I didn't know where the heck I was going, but I put my trust out there and said, okay, you know, this is what I really am passionate about. I'm going to follow this, and it's, it's amazing what happens to us when we honor that calling in our heart and when we stand right in the middle of our truth of who we are and we stop being what other people want us to be or you know what brings home the paycheck which is what I had been doing before I was just in the mortgage business for the paycheck I wasn't in it for the right reasons and you know it didn't call to my heart now suddenly I'm following my path and my intuitive abilities and really crazy things started <laughs> If that wasn't crazy enough, then really crazy things started oh happening. Oh, my. It's super good advice, though. Trust in the universe. And, yeah, the path's going to be bumpy. But don't you find now, looking back, you wouldn't have done it any other way? No way. It's, uh, you know, now it's, um, to me, it is beautiful. And it's so synchronized. And, and at the time, it was like, you know, bump after lump after bump. And it was very unsettling, but it was something that I really had to rise above kind of the ego side of my brain that wanted to be in control of my future and my destiny and make the right decisions, and I had to trust what my heart was telling me. I wasn't in alignment, Sandra. My brain was saying one thing. My heart was saying something else, and I know a lot of people can relate to that, and that resonates with them, and that's where I... It got a little scary. I didn't know exactly what was going to happen, but I let things play out the way they needed to play out, and boy, did they. And it led me to where I am today, which I never set out to do this. I never said, you know what, I'm going to become an afterlife expert, and I'm going to talk to thousands and thousands of animals and help people all across the world and write books. I didn't do that. It just all organically happened. It's amazing, and I think I saw on your website, it's over... 20,000 animals you've worked with? Yes. Documented, yes. That's tons of animals. That's a lot. How did Mind you boggling. hang the shingle for the first time that you're an animal communicator? <laughs> oh, very, very shaken in my boots. <laughs> I bet. I, it was not easy. I got ridiculed. I got called names. I was told by... Uh, people that I was doing, you know, evil work and yes. the devil work and witchcraft. And, you know, I got, I was told I was a heathen, um, just mean stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, people who don't understand what I do can be very hurtful with their comments. Fortunately, as a police officer, I grew some pretty sick skin, mm -hmm. so I was able to muddle through. Uh, but I realized very early on that not everyone was as excited about my new profession as I was. Right. So I had to find my tribe and I had to find my, the people that resonated with me that, that were into the same things I was into. And it was not easy. I first went down the wrong path. I went down the path of, of just pet lovers, animal lovers, pet lovers. And believe it or not, that wasn't where I needed to be. I had to go, where people were all more interested in metaphysical and more spiritual work and that were more open to uh, energy and energy work and healing and that sort of thing. So it was not the direction I thought I needed mm -hmm. to go in. 
And again, it took quite a few years before I actually discovered, you know, that I was kind of preaching to the wrong choir and I needed to shift my perspective over to the, you know, conscious thought, the metaphysical, spiritual. So what I did was I I went from attending pet festivals and, and pet expos, I shifted to metaphysical expos and psychic expos. Mm -hmm. And that's when everything went kaboom and I found the right tribe. And, and I, that's how I really started out was attending those expos. I was literally one of those people sitting at a card table from Friday until Sunday. And I would do back to back to back readings, pet readings during the expo. That's how I got my start. That's pretty incredible. Did people have their pets there, or you did this remotely? No, I had just had them bring a picture, or most people had a cell phone picture wow. with them. And uh, I know it's if you've never heard of animal communication, it's like, what? You don't have the pet there? What's that all about? Um, the great thing about energy and the work that I do is, you know, we don't need to have the physical presence of the animal to connect because we're connecting through our energy, mind to mind. It's based on telepathy, which, you know, is has been known and studied for, you know, Long eons. Time. Nothing new. And if you're interested in telepathy, by all means, you know, research it and find out about it. But that's what I do. I basically send an energetic message to the animal and they answer me or respond energetically and they don't have to be anywhere near me. In fact, one of the first times I had a, a client contact me, she was in Japan and she had a missing cat and she wrote to me desperately seeking help for her lost cat and she said, my cat only knows Japanese, are you still able to communicate with it? And I said, I have no idea. You know, this is new to me, I've never tried to connect with an animal that has never spoken a word of English before. And lo and behold, the cat spoke to me in perfect English. Now, you say, how can a cat speak English? There is a translation process that takes place. It's much like if you have an interpreter when you go to a foreign country. Um, that's what it's like. So the cat is able to share its messages, a translation takes place, I hear the messages in my own voice, in my own head, and in English so that I understand them, or I get images or feelings that I understand. And this comes from working very closely with my spirit guides. My spirit guides are with me, and they are my team, and they help me bring the animal spirits to me, the animal energy to me, the animal messages to me, and it is a group effort. I'm not doing this alone. I have a team of helpers that do the translation for me. Mm -hmm. So when an animal in Japan sends me a message in Japan, my spirit team is receives that message, translates it, and sends it to me in a form I understand in split-second timing. Was the cat found? Yes. Good. And then I had a client from Germany who had a very expensive racehorse or show horse and spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on this horse and it was acting up, it was throwing the trainer, it was just really being obnoxious and she said the same thing, you know, my horse only knows me, I speak German, I don't speak English around the horse, the trainer speaks German, you know, can you communicate? I said, I don't know, I guess we're going to find out and perfect English. So you know, I can't tell you scientifically you know, how no, all of it works. You don't have to. <laughs> it's, all I know is it works, and I just roll with it. It's yeah. like I'm happy. I get the information. The client's, clients happy, happy. They get Animals happy. Yep. Okay. Animals happy. Everyone's happy. So oh, I here comes my it. animal right around the corner. Aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> Talking to Karen in the world, <laughs> and he walks right by to the food bowl. <laughs> So, Karen, this is Oh, those darn cats. I, I know. This is fascinating. It really is. But I want to ask you now, also, because the name of our show is We Don't Die, you have tapped into the energy of these creatures and been able to communicate and um, 
do some pretty great things. But what, how did you, I don't want to say you would transition, but sort of into realizing that even dead animals can talk. You know what I'm getting at? I know. Yeah. Yeah. It was um, not on purpose. I actually didn't believe at first, this sounds terrible, but it's the truth. I didn't really believe that we could communicate with a deceased pet. You know, remember I was a cop and I came from very evidence and factual, you know, if you don't have evidence, you don't have a case. So I was like, you know, no way. If, you know, if an animal passes away, there's no way you could communicate with it. So again, I was, you know, surprised to find out that an animal who has passed on, no matter how recent or how long ago it was, is still very present, very much with us, very much connected, tuned in, watching over us in their favorite places, doing their favorite things. It's almost as if nothing has changed for that pet. In fact, they are free from pain and they love their freedom that they can zip around and go with us places that they could never go with us before in physical form. So it was quite by fluke and shock just in the thousands and thousands of sessions that I was conducting that I started communicating with departed pets and their messages. And what blew me away, Sandra, was their messages were very present time. They didn't say things like, well, when I was alive, I liked, you know, chicken or whatever they would say. (laughs) (laughs) They would talk about... They would talk about the here and now, like my mom got up this morning and she had crumpets for breakfast, you know, and it's like, what? Your mom had a what? A crumpet. And I was like, what's a crumpet? So this is me having this conversation in my head with this deceased cat. And it turns out that the client did indeed have crumpets that morning for breakfast. A friend of hers had sent them from England as a gift and she had crumpets. Well, I didn't even know what it was. I had to look it up. It's like a little English muffin thing. But of all things, for a deceased pet to talk about, you know, eating crumpets. So that's the stuff that, to me, is evidential. That's evidential proof. Who would know that? It's not like I followed this lady around with a hidden camera in her (laughs) kitchen that morning and watched her eating a weird English muffin thing called a crumpet. You know, that, to me, was so shocking, so amazing, and so brilliant, and just like, kaboom. I couldn't get enough of it, and I was fascinated that a departed pet could share such present-day, moment-to-moment information about their human, their life, and what was going on. That, to me, just is mind-boggling. And so I I really started to focus my attention and, and sharpen my skills so that I could obtain those messages from departed pets because it was the clients who came to me who were grieving and struggling with the loss of a pet. That's where I noticed when I delivered messages from their pet, even if it was like a crumpet, I mean, it sounds crazy, but that client would have this miraculous healing take place. Like they were grieving and in pain and, and unable to focus and overwhelmed before the session after the session they were smiling and happy and you know oh my gosh I feel so much better and this just is amazing and I can't believe he's still with me and he saw me eating the crumpet that was like to me that's where I realized this is what I need to do when a a departed animal can deliver one little message one teeny tiny little message but it changes the whole perspective of that human and it moves them into a space of healing that they could never have found before. Oh my gosh, I'm all over that. I'm all for uh, that. Amen, sister. I'm with you on that because the whole conversation of believing in the afterlife and the shows we have, it helps heal hearts. It, it gives hope and faith and the knowing and it's, it really helps heal and grief we've, and I'm sure you've had your share of loss in your life. It's awful. And it people, is. and I, this may sound really awful, but you, I'm sure you know this as well. When we really love someone, grief hurts. It's unbelievably 
painful. When we don't know somebody so much, well, we don't really feel it or, you know, that. But animals creep into our hearts in the deepest location that we have the most love for these beings that are just all unconditional love. And the grief we feel when we have a pet no longer in physical is awful. And then those of us who have to make the decision that it's time to, um, yeah, yeah, put the cat to sleep, awful, uh, right. and all that stuff. So I know firsthand how deep this love is and how painful the grief is. And so to have well, and- somebody connect with my sweetie yes. on the other side, yes, yeah. I'm all for it. I agree. I totally agree. Everything you're saying, and I really truly feel that. And I mean no disrespect to our human loved ones, but I really truly feel that in my experience, I have been so deeply and profoundly overwhelmed with grief by the loss of a pet that I have gotten to the point where I felt like I was having a heart attack. I literally felt physical pain in my chest. I hurt so badly. And there is a condition called broken heart syndrome that is real. It's really a real thing, and it affects women more than men. But it is a physical reaction to grief. I mean, this is real stuff we're talking about here. And, you know, this pain from a loss of a pet, we start, you know, doubting ourselves, second-guessing, you know, how we cared for the pet. Did I do the right thing? Did I make the right decisions? Did I take him for the right procedures? Did I keep them here too long? Did I take their life too soon? Do they forgive me? You know, all of these things that we beat ourselves up for over and over again. And on the flip side of that, here's the pet coming through to me, happy and smiling and excited and they're having a great time and they're um, light and beautiful and shining and loving life and they have no regrets and no sorrows. And, and here we are, stuck in our grief right and we can't get through it we we can't it's like it pulls us down and it's so heavy and what our animals the i'd say the big takeaway for your listeners the big takeaway here is first and foremost your pets love you more than anything else in this world and there is nothing that you did in the care or the end of life that is going to change that for them because they know that you came from a place of love and that you intended to do the very best that you could, whatever the situation is. Even when accidents happen, I've had clients that have accidentally run over their own pets. I have clients that have accidentally caused the death or put their animals in harm's way, let their dog out to go outside and didn't shut the gate and the dog passes away when a car hits them. Mm-hmm. I mean, you name it. I've had a client with that experience. It has never failed that the animal comes through. First and foremost, this is really interesting to me. The, the humans want to focus on that moment, that horrible moment. And guess what? The animals don't. Sometimes, Sandra, they won't even talk about that moment, the moment of death, the moment that they were hit, the moment that something attacked them, the moment that they died. They don't focus on that. That's a human, that's a human thing. Animals want to talk about happy times, joyful times, good things, positive things, funny things. It's the human that keeps bringing me back to the blood and the gore and the, you know, reliving this horrible, torturous moment, the animals don't even go there. So I will honor whatever the animal wants. If the animal wants to talk about it, fine, which is rare. Um, Sometimes I'll see a flash or an image or I'll go, oh, that didn't go very well. But very rarely do they want to discuss, like, the worst moment of their life. They want us to remember and celebrate the love that we shared, the good times, the happy times, all of those special memories, the way they died or the end of their life does not define who they are. And humans tend to make the animals 
death and the way they passed more important than their life and celebrate who they are as the living, wonderful companion that they had for all those years. It's a weird um, um, comparison of the human perspective versus the animal's perspective. And I'm still, to this day, fascinated by the animals just don't go there. Even when it's... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. I'm just saying I work with a lot of mediums. And it's the same thing. The loved one might come through, the human loved one and deceased might come through with just like matter of fact, here's how I die just for the yeah. confirmation that, yeah, this is me. But then they want yeah. to talk about how they lived and the shared yes. memories and the love and those kind of things. So, yes, it's true. The same. So Karen, we have a lot to learn from our pets. Are from, there from the other side? I'm interrupting you. So sorry. It's so much easier when we're, we'd be face to face, but we're not. But that's okay. <laughs> um, are there things that you've heard that? Oh my God! Only the pet could know. And now you. Oh know. yeah. You've had okay, those. Okay. Yep. I've got a few. Got okay. a few for you. Okay. So. Um, I love your stories, I, by the way. <laughs> I connect. I've got a million of them. I was connecting with a deceased cat. This cat was. Um, a beloved kitty. He lived a long time. He was a stray, and then this woman kind of took him in, took care of him, and, and he lived in her yard. And beautiful boy, big, like, tabby stripe boy. And um, she was on her way to a meeting, and she was running late, and so she was backing her car out of the garage. And um, she didn't check where the kitty was, and she backed over him. Now, he didn't die from that, but he was... Um, pretty severely injured, and so she took him into, of course, the emergency, and um, he sustained some pretty severe injuries. Well, when I was connecting with him, he had passed on from a result of his injury. So he didn't die at that moment. He died about two weeks later. So during the session, the cat, who's deceased, kept showing me an amputated leg and kept talking about a leg amputation. And what was throwing me off was that it was a human leg. It wasn't a cat leg. Mm -hmm. Now, me and my little puny brain, as I'm doing this in my own head, I'm thinking, why is this cat showing me a human leg when he was the one that was run over? And I know he sustained leg injuries because he couldn't walk for a while. And I didn't understand why he was showing me a human amputated leg. So I didn't say anything. Finally, the cat kept sending me the same message over and over again. It's just like the universe. When we get that same message over and over again, it's like, you need to pay attention. So I finally said to my client, I don't know why, but your cat is showing me this amputated leg, and I don't understand what that's about. And all of a sudden, she went, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, Karen, oh, my gosh. And she starts crying like like uncontrollable sobs, crying, crying, crying. And I was like, Oh, what did I do? What did I say? I felt horrible. Well, when she composed herself, she says, I can't believe you said that. And I said, well, fill me in. What, what's this all about? She says, I said, did he, did he lose a leg? She goes, no. She goes, he didn't lose his leg. He lost mobility for a while, but he didn't lose a leg. She says, I was in a, a terrible car accident about three months ago, and I had to have my leg amputated. Wow. Now, the cat had been gone. The cat was gone when she had the accident. He was already passed. So that gave her, that was her one little message. I always tell my clients, you'll get one little message that will change your life forever. (laughs) You might get more, but, but there will always be at least one message where you go, without a doubt, hands down, there is no way Karen was, you know, following me around with spy cameras or drones or whatever that will change your life and, and, prove to you that the afterlife is real. Our pets are there. They're with us. They're present tense with us. They're not in a faraway place. They're not, you know, up in the clouds. They're here with us, watching over us, around us, just like they were in physical. That was a monumental moment for that client, and it finally helped her heal. She said up until that point, she had really been struggling because she lost him. You know, she ran over him, caused, she felt caused his death. She got in an accident, lost her leg. She was on a downward spiral. She was depressed. She couldn't do anything for herself. She's having to rehab and learn how to do. She just didn't want to live anymore. I deliver that one little message. She is now volunteering at the local shelter. She's going to uh, hospitals and doing lectures and talking to people about 
you know, having losing a limb, others who have lost a limb, she found, oh, I'm getting chills right now, she found this new purpose in her life, this new sense, and it's all because of that one little message from her cat. Oh, that's so great. And we are in the business of not only healing hearts, but giving people life again. So whether it's through animal communication or uh, learning something about the afterlife or near-death experiences or mediumship or whatever that is to get people back on their life again. Because I know it, you know it, when we close our last our, t- our eyes the last time here on earth, we're going to open them up again and everybody's going to be there. And pets included, and we want to look back on our life like we went for it, we made the most of it. Not when my animal or my beloved spouse died, I gave up living myself. Because so many people die inside when they're experiencing grief. And meanwhile, our loved one or loved animal is just around. Karen, is it possible that, and I, I think I know the answer, like I went to bed not too long ago and felt like my cat Millie jumped up, jumped up on the bed. And she's been gone quite a while. But I actually felt that. So when you say they're still around, is that something that people could feel or get that sense if we're in tune with our own? Uh, yes. So. And, oh, I hear this from the animals so often. Um, it takes a lot of energy for a departed spirit to manifest so that we can see them, hear them, or feel them. So most of the time, our departed pets will come to us in our dreams because that's when our uh, subconscious brain is more open to receiving information. We're less likely to discount it as, you know, false or, you know, our brain won't kick it out. So we're open to receiving those energetic visitations from them. Those are real. Our pets are really visiting us in our dreams, and some of them can be quite vivid. But when they actually manifest, when they, you feel them walk across the bed, when you feel them brush past you, if you hear their toenails across the floor, you hear their, their uh, chain, their metal, what are those, tags, their tags clinking, the bowl moving, the doggy door flap moving, when an animal manifests to do something like that, it takes tons of energy for them to do that. And they get so overjoyed when we acknowledge them, you know, is that you, Millie? Is that, I just felt you jump on the bed. Please do it again. You know, I welcome your visits. You know, I miss you. I love you. I'm so glad you're here. When we do that, we fuel them with spiritual fuel. They can then send more messages, manifest more. When we discount it and say, oh, it's my imagination, I must be tired, I'm crazy, I don't know what I'm hearing or what I'm seeing, it must be the wind or, you know, who knows, they get so frustrated because they're trying so hard to let us know, hey, I'm here, I'm with you, I'm still around, you know, talk about me, think about me, you know, remember me, say my name out loud. When we pay attention to their messages and they can come in all different forms you might even feel a, a, the warmth of them up against you but when you reach down you don't feel anything um it that's them that's really them so tell them how happy that makes you get excited about it ask them to send you more messages give them the spiritual fuel that they need so that they can keep sending more ma- messages the more you pay attention the more they will send. Yeah, this goes for people, too, in the spirit world, to our dear listener who's listening. The more often if say, I don't know, your light flickers or something, "Eh, is that you? You know, whatever. Or if you feel, get somebody in the the dream state and you acknowledge it, like, "Uh, okay, I, I, you know, is that you? Can you do it again? If you can imagine yourself in the spirit world and you're desperately trying to let your person know that you're still around, wouldn't it help to get some feedback, you know, and just say, okay, yeah, all right. Now try to move in a little closer. I'll try to quiet my mind. Let me see if I can feel you and have that relationship still open because the love never dies. Oh, Karen, I love your stories and I want to ask you about your books because I have, and thank you for sending them to me, by the way, but I have a sneaky suspicion that you have a ton of stories in your two books. Here All Creatures, The Journey of an Animal Communicator, and The Amazing Afterlife of Animals, Messages and Signs from Our Pets on the Other Side. Am I correct that they're filled with stories? And oh, more. my gosh. If you want stories, those books are full of stories. And 
The uh, Amazing Afterlife of Animals is my most recent book, and The Journey, uh, Hear All Creatures, The Journey of an Animal Communicator was my first book. So if you want to read them in order, you can. You don't have to, but um, that's the how I wrote them. The first one came out about 11 years ago. But they're full of stories, actual sessions of clients who have uh, very excitedly wanted to share their pictures and their experience. You'll get actual uh, snippets. These aren't whole sessions. Remember, these are just snippets that I've taken yes. from various sessions you know some sessions go an hour long so you can imagine i can't put all of that into a a book or a chapter it would just be too much so um yes if you want stories those books are full of stories i'm actually writing my next manuscript which is going to be just a a continuation of more stories more afterlife uh, messages from pets and um and that's what i'm working on right now I'm so proud of you. And even just looking at your website, your books won 16 awards. And I found you what I thought was randomly, but I don't think it was any accident. I was just scrolling Mm -hmm. on Amazon and you have so many five-star reviews and all the awards. And I'm just like, I don't know who this lady is, but I'm going to find her and I'm going to have her on my show. (laughs) Oh, I'm so glad you did today. find me. I know. And, you know, here's the thing. Um, I actually just received a, a 17th award for that book. And oh, congratulations. I'm so proud of it because what it's doing, Sandra, is it really is taking on a life of its own. And it's getting into the hands of people who are suffering, people who are brokenhearted, people who have no more hope, who have f- felt that they've lost their most beloved, and that there is life isn't worth living. And my book is showing them that, yes, it is, and, and here's why, and here's what's important, and here's how you can heal, and here's how the animals view things. And it's giving them not only that sense and feeling that, you know, it doesn't take a special skill. It doesn't take, you know, years and years and years and years of doing this to be able to send love to your departed pet. Anyone can do it. I teach most people how to send a message to their pet in 15 minutes or less. So it really doesn't take anything special other than the love in your heart and the intention to get a message to them. It's a very simple process, and my book is going out into the world. I'm so proud of it. It's helping so many people heal from the deepest, darkest pain. I'm just so proud of that. Oh, I'm proud of you too. And I'm on your website now, animalcommunicating.com. And I'm a correct that you're giving away a free paperback of your book and people only pay the shipping? Yes, I know. Woman. I'm, I'm a crazy person. I'll actually, um, you can get both of my books for free. Just pay shipping. And here's my theory. Here's my theory on that. Um, you can still buy it on Amazon for full price if you want. <laughs> um, but or Kindle, or Audible, and any of those. But my theory is this. I'm old school. I like having a book in my hand Mm -hmm. when I read. I just love that comfort of having to pick it up whenever I want, and it's in my hand, and I can hold it. But I want this book to help more people. And if I can get it into the hands of more people at a lower price, think of how many hearts I'm healing. Think of how many pets I'm helping. Think about the good karma I'm creating Mm -hmm. for myself (laughs) <laughs> so it's really very selfish of me. <laughs> but in a because, good way. No, yes, yeah, well. it's a lot of people. <laughs> no, don't don't ever feel that. I, I very secretly have a lot of PDF files of my book floating around the internet. And when someone's in need, I, it just gets sent to them. And yes. even though they think it's just a few first few chapters, they're getting the whole thing. And if yeah, if you want to buy the whole book, I'm all for it. But I don't want money to be the reason you don't get the information. No. So you're exactly. doing the same thing. So kudos to I'm you. Doing, yes, I'm doing the same thing. And you know what? It's all good. It's, it's really about getting um, into the hands of people who need it the most. Most people can afford, you know, seven ninety nine. It's you know, eight ninety nine in Canada. International orders I can do. However, you know, it depends on whatever the shipping rate is to wherever they live. So I'm trying my best as a um, business owner to pay it forward, to put that good energy out there, and to help more and more and more people. 
and and really that's what's important to me. You know, selling books isn't important. Um, mending broken hearts and healing and providing a catalyst for somebody having a new day and a new perspective. That's what it's all about. It is. And I want to ask you too about coaching because obviously, you know, there's only one Karen, (laughs) but you teach people how to be an animal communicator. I do. It's one of my favorite things. My passion is sharing this incredible experience and opening up minds and opening up dimensions and helping people realize that it really is easy. The steps to learn are simple. You know, it takes years of practice to be able to get the type of uh, detail that I obtain. Years of practice. However, some people are just more gifted and they get it quicker than I did. You know, I, I really had to practice a long time. Everyone's different. Everyone's at a different level. But yes, I, I offer private coaching Um, where you work with me one-on-one and I give you my full attention. And I also have an online course if you're brand new, have never communicated before with a pet and you just don't really know too much about it. I have an online course that teaches the basics. And then once you've got your foot in the door and you're practicing with pets, then working with me one-on-one, I also help people become professional animal communicators and help them launch their business and help them get their message out into the world because we need more animal communicators in this world. We need more people to understand how energy works, how the afterlife works, and, you know, that's what it's all about for me. That's great. You've helped people get their books published too, haven't you? I do. I do. um, I have two book coaching programs. One is how to publish to become a bestseller because I have two bestsellers now, Mm -hmm. written books and two bestsellers. And the other one is a book marketing and profit maximizer, how to get the most profit um, by putting your book in the right hands. There's so much confusion out there. Once you write a book, you just think magically people are going to start buying it because you're on Amazon, and that's that's not the case. That is not the case. (laughs) (laughs) It's not the case. So I learned through a lot of you know, speed bumps and hard knocks and getting, you know, run over and backed over a few times. You know, I learned what not to do in the book industry and how to find your target audience and how to really narrow down the uh, the audience of, of which you should spend your very, very um, valuable advertising dollars and, and maximize your profits. So that's, um, to me, what it's all about, you know, getting it into the right hands, getting it in front of the right audience. You know, you wouldn't write a book about coffee beans and try to sell it to people who are tea drinkers. Mm-hmm. You know, that just doesn't work. So the, the coaching programs help to get really clear on your goals. And um, there's so many people who've written books and have books on Amazon or have manuscripts they want to get on Amazon. So it's really helping people uh, get their books out into the world and their message in the right hands. It's great that you offer that in addition to all the animal communication things. Because I know for myself, I knew I had a book in me, but I was too afraid. I thought, who's going to listen to me? Do my words really matter? And look where we are now. This is episode 329 of the show with um, quite a few listeners into the hundreds of thousands now. And yes, our words matter. So if you're sitting there thinking, do my words matter? If you think people need to hear them, you possibly have a book in you. So Karen would be a good person to start with. So animalcommunicating.com is your main website. You get a free copy of her book, which I'm so excited you sent to me because I love your stories. I don't want to hang up right now from this interview because I just want more, (laughs) but I know we must because it's just been an hour or so. Karen, do you have some closing words or any, anything else that you want to share? Any advice, any, anything? I do. Absolutely. Okay. I think the big takeaway here, Sandra, truly, I want to thank you so much and your listeners for sticking with us through the end of the show here. It's just an honor to walk this path and to share my experiences. You know, just reach out to me if you have questions, if you're new to this. You know, I I, I love sharing my knowledge and, and information with others. And truly grab a copy of my book. It is a, It can be a life-changing experience if you're suffering from the pain from grief, I just want to let you know that there is help out there 
and there are people who who do care and they want you to move into healing you know um when you're ready to do so and and really truly your pets want you to be happy and live your life to the fullest they get a direct benefit when you are loving life and living a full and happy life they benefit from that energy so you'll actually be helping your departed pets by living your life to the fullest that's so nice. Yes. And our loved ones that were here in as a human being as well. Yes. I think and that just goes really, to say. Really yeah. quick. Sure. They're often they often come through together when I do sessions. Your departed pets and your departed loved ones come through together. Oh, so you've gotten people coming through. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's oh, so yeah. cool. So cool. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love you. I thank you. I <laughs> love oh, you too. <laughs> yes. And for our listener, I love you too, wherever you are in the world, even though you're like, she doesn't know me. How can she love me? Well, you're listening and you're somebody who is interested in this topic and you're interested in yourself having a, a great life. And my heart goes out to you if you've experienced loss. And obviously the older we get, the more we do, but just know that there's this invisible world around us that everybody's fine and healthy. It's being a human is the uh, the hard part. So a reminder, Karen Anderson was our guest today. Her website, animalcommunicating.com is someplace you should go and pick up her free book. And um, also thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode as a reminder, or maybe not a reminder, if this is your first episode, all past episodes are available on we don't die radio.com. There are 328 other episodes, by the way. And if you can join us in Fort Lauderdale in December, live streams, I would recommend. If you can't, just check out we don't die Fort Lauderdale.com or we don't die radio.com on our website. There's something that pops up called the Insiders Club. And you'll receive what it says is the first few chapters of my book. Secret is it's the whole book and a very healing audio called How to Survive Grief. And if you're somebody who's on Facebook, you can type in We Don't Die Listeners. We've got a Facebook group of more than 5,000 fabulous people that you can openly talk about your grief, openly talk about signs that you get from your loved ones, uh, all things afterlife can be shared with a group of people that it's just very easy to talk to. So in closing, just one more thank you to Karen. Thank you, Karen, <laughs> for being our thank guest. Thank you. And my name is Sandra Champlain. Always so delighted to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that each one of our lives here are important. And like Karen said, trust the universe. Your journey might be a bumpy ride, but that's all part of life. But I tell you, there's a point where you look back and you realize that the pain, the suffering all led you to where you are on your spiritual path. And if you can set your eyes on serving others, even in the smallest of ways, I do believe that our life works out. So I want to thank you for listening and we'll see you soon. Mm-hmm.